The name we're given at birth is not the only name we live with. Life layers on us so many other names that it's easy to forget who we really are. But as we surrender each flawed name at the feet of Jesus, we live more and more in the undeniable truth of what God, our Creator, has named us. Well, good morning, Christ the King Church. It's good to see you. And like Brian pointed out, I, I know that it's good to see me. Yeah. <laughs> we are going through this sermon series called Named, where we explore some of the names that God gives us in Scripture, often in exchange for names that we've given ourselves. My name is Ryan, and I honestly don't know if my parents knew this or not, but Ryan means little king. And that just fits incredibly well for those that know me. My middle name is Keith, and that name comes from my grandfather. And my grandfather, Keith, was kicked out of Bible school for smoking. He would also take his family out on vacations paid for by poker winnings. My other grandfather, his nickname was Shorty. That's where the little comes from. Here's a true story. Shorty died just a few months after I was born with a bullet in his back from his years as a bootlegger. So to recap our time this morning, my name is Ryan, I am the little king, and I come from a prestigious lineage of short Bible school dropouts, and we're filled with gamblers, drinkers, and smokers, and I'm here to remind you that at Christ the King Community Church, there is always a place for you. We are glad that you are here. When I was in college, my roommates and I, we had a reunion of sorts. Now we call it a Friendsgiving. We didn't know what to call it then. We just called it a reunion. And we were a little nervous because it was some of our best friends from high school and some of our new college friends. And we didn't know how, how the mix was going to work. So many of the people didn't know each other. And I like to cook, and so I put a bit of time into that. Side note, I just made the best turkey I've ever made for Thanksgiving, and I'm going to retire. I'm going to hand the baton off. Like, you're just not going to... I'm going to go out of winter, people. So back when my turkey wasn't as good for all my friends, trying it out on them. And again, we were nervous, not sure how, how the mix would work. And it worked so well. Everybody got along fabulously. And I remember sitting in, in the corner of, of the kitchen, looking at across all my friends. And I, I can still see my folded up ping pong table in the back, which I really wanted to use as our dinner table. I still want to use it as our dinner table. Wife said no. And I remember looking at each one of my friends, feeling such deep love and affection for them. And I also became keenly aware that this is the most empty I have ever felt. I feel incredibly empty right now. Have you ever been surrounded by everything that you would ever need and still felt dissatisfied? Like it's just not enough. Sometimes in those moments, I don't know about you, but when everybody's having a good time and then I'm just, in a, I'm just not feeling it and then I feel bad that I feel bad and now I start to feel bad that I feel bad that I, and it just escalates and compounds. Well, that was kind of me at the time. I don't know why I do that. It's just silly. But if I'm going to be real and transparent with you, and this is hard for me to say, I'd need to tell you that loneliness has been the biggest motivator for most of my life. I couldn't put language to it, and I didn't have the tools that I would need to explore that some more, but loneliness is actually what brought me to CTK. Loneliness has been the biggest source of my greatest despair. In the Garden of Eden, well, hang on, and I know, let me, let me just pause, and I know what you guys are thinking. How can such a good-looking funny, smart, 
I've got pages of this, people. I can keep going. <laughs> Guys, such as yourself, experience loneliness in, I don't know. And I would even say there's a part of me that feels shame for even saying that because I, I feel like I need a more sophisticated problem than loneliness. But it's simply not the case. Loneliness has been the biggest driver for most of my life. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had perfect connection and relationship with God and with each other. And it stands out to me that after they sinned, God didn't go up to them and shame them. He didn't go up to them and say, what have you done? He simply went up to them and said, where did you go? What happened? It's like God was saying, there used to be this connection between us. Now it's not there anymore. And it's gone forever. Now let me expand on this problem just to make it a little more uncomfortable for all of us. Sometimes when we feel that, we can place that God need and that God expectation onto others. Right? Imagine at that dinner party, at that friend's giving, me feeling this intense knowledge that this isn't enough. And then I start to go around the room and start telling people why they're not living up to my expectations or meeting my needs. Sometimes we do that at church, too, that we have these gaps in ourselves and we place these needs onto the church instead of God himself. This is the last week in our sermon series called Named. And the last name that we're going to explore is really easily overlooked and dismissed. But as I've prayed through this and as I've worked on this message, I'm going to say this is the most healing name God has ever given me. Today, we're going to talk about the name Friend of God. My wife and I, we have three kids at home. And if I ask my youngest about his friends at school, he will tell me the most epic stories of who is the fastest in his class, how they were able to outrun the girls today, how uh, they competed, and how they worked together to solve different problems in class. And it is engaging. Like, I want to be in second grade, and I want to be your friend. And the next day, I'll pick him up from school and say, hey, tell me about, tell me about your friend. And then he'll say, oh, we're not friends anymore. Like, just like that. And I was going, oh man, what happened? You guys get in a fight? No, we're just, we're just not friends anymore. Clean break. And then I'll ask my daughters, my adolescent daughters about their friends. And it's not long after I do that, that I am keenly aware of my own limitations. <laughs> Where there is so much emotion, so much charge, so much energy in, in their uh, relationships with their friends, I have limited ability to enter into their world, but it is very important to them. If you were to ask me about my friends, I'd point out to you that I have 1,248 Facebook friends. Isn't that great? This is where you guys are supposed to applaud. I'm really confused. <laughs> my sad and lonely wife only has 292 friends. Isn't that? Let's just say, she's not sad or lonely. She's just pickier than I am which I take as an intense compliment. I'll take anything as a compliment, but I'll take that especially. But when I think about what a friend is, or the friends that I have, honestly, I just need people to laugh at my jokes and I'll go first, that's okay. But I just want people in my life that's easy to be with. That's kind of it. Just people that's, that are fun, that are easy for me to be with. There's this principle in scripture. It's called the great commandment. And if you're gonna memorize one verse of the Bible, this would be one that I would recommend. It's simply this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said this is so important that it summarizes two thirds of the Bible. Big deal. When I think about my friends giving, that's actually what was missing in my life. That I was living out of order and expecting others to meet my God needs. I wasn't loving God first. This is why friendship with Jesus is so important. Jesus' invitation to be his friend first 
allows for the possibility of other relationships that I have to be healthy. If I can be friends with Jesus, I can be good friends with you. Friendship isn't only important in my relationship with God. Friendship is also very important in marriage. Marriage researcher Dr. John Gottman has been able to predict divorce with 95% accuracy. And he's been able to do this for over 40 years. And as intimidating as that is, here's something that's even more intimidating. He only needs 15 minutes. Again, he's been able to do this for over 40 years. He's been able to predict divorce with 95% accuracy in only 15 minutes. And here is basically the only thing he's looking for. He's asking himself, are they treating each other like they would a friend? If there's a foundational friendship, then there's an ability to grow closer together and to navigate life's challenges. In marriage, it isn't commitment, passion, sex, or money. And I like all those, but they don't hold a candle to friendship. Friendship is what matters most. Do you just like each other? Another reason friendship matters so much is because it also mattered to Jesus. Jesus, we are about to enter into the Christmas season where we are reminded again, he joined us. He came to us. And he lived in community. And during Jesus' darkest times, he drew closer to his friends. Just think about what communion is. Jesus said, I have eagerly waited to have this final dinner with you. The Last Supper is highly symbolic, but really it's just dinner with friends. Friendship matters in your faith like it matters in your marriage and in all of your relationships. Well, that's great, Pastor Ryan, but how do you actually become a friend of God? And I am so glad that you asked, church, because I have a lot more to say here. There's this amazing moment in the book of John where Jesus is just about to be arrested and he pulls his closest followers to them and he says, all right, now you're my friends. And then Jesus goes on to describe what that looks like. John 15 is a personal favorite of mine. And the text that we're about to go through is dense. It is heavy. It's like every sentence Jesus says is a sermon. Maybe like a sermon series. It's, it's just a lot. But we're going to go through there and just skim the top and take out four truths about what it means to be a friend of God. Jesus said this, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other the way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves. Some translations say servants. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I've told you everything that the Father has told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. And Jesus says it again just because we forget. This is my command. Love each other. Again, you guys, there's so much in here, and we're just going to pull out some simple truths, but I think it's going to be enough for us to have a meaningful time together. Truth number one about being a friend of God. A friend of God remains. Some translations say abide. A friend of God remains. This just means to keep the relationship current, keep up to date. Close friends keep up with each other's lives. 
They know all the latest news, what's going on with each other. They know all the uh, recent events. Have you ever had a friend that you just lost touch with? You can imagine, well, I, I, I know this is true for you. That's probably happened a lot over the last two years. And I imagine uh, that you can understand that keeping up with 1,248 friends is kind of burdensome, right? There's just some people that we lose touch with. And maybe this happened for you over Thanksgiving, that the last time you saw this person, they were this tall. And now they're this tall. You're pretty sure they can beat you in an arm wrestling contest and they wear braces, right? Who they are has changed and I need to update who they are in my head. We haven't remained in, in relationship and connection. And that's just fine. You can't do that with everybody, but we haven't remained. This can even happen with people that were around a lot. You can be around someone all the time, but not connect relationally. Like in marriage, when you haven't been out on a date or spent the intentional time connecting, you can, you can lose touch. And that, it just happens. You get busy focusing on life's chores. Which kid goes where? We're out of milk. So-and-so is sick. I need to stay late at work. And so on. You can, just, you can just get out of sync. And it's not bad. But when you finally sit down, just the two of you, sometimes you don't know what to talk about because you're so used to talking business. Right? I've had more awkward dates with Nicole, my wife, than, I, than I've had with Nicole, my girlfriend. And again, that's okay. It just means that we need to set the list down and just be with each other. And I think about that with my relationship with the Lord all the time. What does it mean to just sit my list down, all my prayer requests? It's not like he doesn't know them. But what if I were to just sit them down and just be with him? On my... Um, I'm not the most verbal person in the world. I call myself a verbal minimalist. So I, I just don't have a whole lot of words to exhaust. Uh, and you know what, people? That's true in my prayer life, too. I often just don't have a lot to say. And I think that's okay. You can just sit and you can just be with him. Have you ever gone on a long road trip or somebody and you just find yourself drifting in and out of conversation and it's the most comfortable thing in the world? Right? You don't have to fill the space. You don't have to. You can talk, you can not talk. It's just nice to be with each other. That's what it's like to remain in him. Now, there's two practices that I find helpful with this. The first one is, we've, I've kind of talked about it already, is just stillness. Just sitting and being with him. And you don't have to say anything. You just bring yourself before him and you just, you just are. You're just with him. The second one is uh, kind of the opposite, and it's, I, it's called unceasing prayer. Now, before you roll your eyes at me, just give me a second to explain. When I first read in the Bible that we are to pray without ceasing, when I read that, I thought, you know, I guess I don't know what prayer is then, because I've never seen that. Like, I definitely cease. I don't, what in the world is does it mean to pray without ceasing? There's also another verse in, in the New Testament that says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Do you know what is unceasing in your life? The tape that's going on in your head that's saying, man, that preacher's really good looking. He should get up here more often. Right? Or the conversations that you rehearse. You know what I should have said? I should have said blank. Blank. Right? That's, psychologists call it your self-talk. That is unceasing. What if that can be baptized, so to speak? And we make that, and just acknowledge God's presence in there. If he really is omnipresent, I don't have to invite him. He's already there. Right? What if I just acknowledge his presence in my own head, and just drift in and out of conversation with him in there? Couldn't that be prayer without ceasing? A friend of God remains. Truth number two is a friend of God obeys quickly. A friend of God obeys quickly. Jesus says, very simply, you are my friends if you obey what I command. Abraham is the first person that the Bible calls a friend of God, and I'm going to tell you a crazy story about Abraham. 
It's a crazy story. It's actually the same scene where God changes his name, so it's very relevant to this sermon series. He changes God, Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. And he says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have this prestigious lineage, unlike Pastor Ryan. You're going to have this prestigious lineage, and actually that lineage is going to bless the whole world, and that's what happened through Jesus. And he said, here's what I need you to do, though, Abraham. I need you to follow me. And there's going to be a sign that you're my follower. And this is about to get awkward, particularly for the guys in the room. But the sign that God called Abraham to was circumcision. Now, if you have any questions about circumcision or any concerns about me speaking about that, feel free to send me an email. My email address is grantf at ctk.church. I will be happy to promptly respond to any inquiry that you might have about circumcision. One of my favorite topics. But the Bible, this is what's crazy about that. The Bible says that Abraham did it that same day. Can you imagine being that sure about anything in your life that you do that? He did that to himself, and he's 99 years old. We're going to stop there. And to his whole company, all the dudes in his party. Can you imagine showing up to work? And you see your boss with a honing knife. And then you see some guys in the corner just curled over. And your boss says, oh, you must have missed my email. Anyway, it's your turn. (laughs) And they did it. That same day, a friend of God obeys quickly. Jesus said, there's a sign for my followers as well. Again, grant F at ctk.church if you have any concerns. Jesus said, there's also a sign for my followers. And I love the way that my friend, Pastor Brian Steele, talks about this. He says, in Jesus' day, there were many rabbis in Israel many rabbis with even more disciples. And these disciples would do everything they could to imitate their master, to imitate their rabbi. They would walk like them, talk like them, keep the same schedule, read the same books. Like, they would eat the same thing at the same time, in the same way. It would be super easy and simple to say, Tim there is a disciple of Rabbi Joe because he walks and he talks like Rabbi Joe. It's the easiest thing in the world to pick out. Jesus said, you are to be able to pick out my disciples by this one thing, how they love each other. That is to be the distinguisher of our master. As a a follower of Jesus, we are to stand out by the way that we love each other. A friend of God obeys quickly. Rick Warren says this, delayed obedience is disobedience. I'm going to say that again because I love and hate it just as much as you do. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Is there something in your life that you're saying no or not yet to Jesus? A friend of God remains. He stays, stays current. And a friend of God obeys quickly. A friend of God, number three, is informed. Jesus says this, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything that the Father has told me. Everything, Jesus says, and it's all written down. We've been emphasizing spiritual practices here at Christ the King for the last couple years, and I'm pretty good at some of them. I'm okay at others, and I'm pretty terrible at maybe most of them. But several years ago, research was done on which spiritual practices made the most impact at different stages of faith. Meaning, okay, uh, say somebody just came to faith. Is now a good time to talk to them about fasting? Right? Probably not. But when is a good time to talk to them about just the different practices that help us differently engage and differently attune to God? At what point is a small group, does that make the most sense? One practice stood out in every stage of maturity. And this will be a surprise to absolutely nobody in the room or online, but one practice stood out, and that is engaging with Scripture. 
A friend of God is informed. We have to get into the book. This has been a nutty two years. It's been crazy making, it's been sad, it's been hard and confusing. And I've lost some friends along the way, and I bet you have too. I've lost some friends to death, and I've lost some friends to differences. And I have by no means navigated these last two years perfectly, by no means. But I tell you what, the most grounding thing that I've done over these last two years is just read my Bible. Just read it. Just read it. There's some helpful practices and guides that we keep on our website at ctk.church. There's Lectio Divina, which is a method of just meditating on a verse or a word that can be helpful. It's been used throughout the church for hundreds of years. There's different narrative practices where we engage the senses. Me, I just like to read it. Just read it. Be confused by it. It's okay. You don't have to understand it. He will lead you into truth, the Bible says. Just read it. There's another, another reason to read your Bible, and this is going to border on guilt and manipulation, so I'm going to personalize it because this is absolutely a motivator for me. I imagine standing before him one day and him asking me, Hey, Ryan, hey, little king, what did you think of my word? And I reply to him, You know, I was, I was really busy. I just, didn't, I just didn't have time. Or, you know, there were parts that I didn't understand, so I just gave up. Or even, there were parts that I didn't like, so I quit. I don't want to answer that way, and I don't want you to answer that way. Just get in there. A friend of God remains. A friend of God obeys quickly is informed. And number four, a friend of God produces fruit. Jesus said, I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. He chose you to be his friend. He chose me. We're chosen. And he appointed us to go and produce lasting fruit. One thing is repeatedly clear with Jesus' teachings. We will be assessed and evaluated. And he expects results. There's going to be a test at the end. And he's going to want to see fruitfulness. Now that's scary. I'm actually afraid of that, and I'm not kidding. And I think about it a lot. Let me read a different scripture. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. This scene causes some discomfort in our tummies, and that's not bad. It's called the fear of God, and it's a good thing. The fear of God is the present understanding of our future judgment. The fear of God is the present understanding of our future judgment. There's going to be a test at the end. In college, the hardest and yet best class I had, the teacher handed me and the rest of the class the final on the first day of class. And we were shocked. We thought it was a mistake. But they handed us the syllabus and just like any first day of class here are the course materials here's what we're going to be going through here's the schedule and then they said this here's the final and I'll make a deal with you you can fill this out right now and I'll give you the appropriate grade and you'll get course credit but if there are terms in here that you don't understand if there's so much in this test and in the syllabus that you don't know, that's okay. Just show up tomorrow and we'll go through this together. That's exactly what Jesus does to us. Just show up 
and we will do this together. God expects fruit. And here's what I would say about that. We are to focus on abiding and remaining in him. Jesus says this, remain in me and you will produce fruit. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Lasting fruit comes from remaining in Jesus. And here's what you do with that. You don't focus on the fruit. You pay attention to remaining and obeying and being informed. And then from time to time, just pay attention. The fruit is feedback. Are we producing fruit? Is this, is God in this? You don't focus on the fruit, you focus on remaining. We're going to actually practice that right now. We're going to practice stillness. And here's what I like to do. Go ahead and shift your posture. For those of you online, this may be a good idea. Grant likes to point out, for those of you that are driving, don't swerve and hurt somebody or yourself. But uh, I don't care as much. You can do whatever you want. But for those of us that can, that can do this, go ahead and put both feet on the floor if you can. And you can either put your palms face up. And here's what I like to do. I like to put a hand on my chest just to symbolize comfort and presence. And we're going to close our eyes and we're going to just take some breaths. I'm going to pray at the beginning. It's going to be still in here. And then I'm going to close us in prayer. Jesus, I just want to say that I'm here. And I know that you are too. Help me to fully be here. God, I thank you for this time. Thank you for the season that's right before us. God, would you help me to be present with you? Would you help me to be present with me? And Lord, would you help me to be present with others? God, I thank you for your constant presence. Help us to remain in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we-